You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is August 26, 2019, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, allergy skin testing. Our presenter is Dr. Paul Dowling. He's the Allergy Fellowship Program Director at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Okay, good morning, everyone. This is uh, COLA for August 26, 2019. Um, I'm Paul Dowling. I'm the program director here at Children's Mercy Hospital. Um, and I'm going to do the first hour this morning in which I'm going to talk about skin testing. I um, upfront apologize that I'm not John Oppenheimer, who usually gives this talk, who does an excellent job, but I'll try to pitch hit um, as he wasn't able to do it this year. So. If you bear with me, we're going to talk about skin testing, something that's part of our repertoire and something that defines us as allergists. Um, I have no disclosures that are pertinent to this topic. Um, I'm starting out, I'm trying to have a zen moment here, especially since it's uh, the weather's horrible here in Kansas City this morning. Um, but this is a view from um, um, hopefully where my house will be finally uh, finished in Utah. Um, <laughs> This is this is looking out from the top of um, the, um, the little knoll that um, I'm building the house on, and this overlooks Park City and the surrounding area. So I just look at that, and that's my little Zen moment here. So I'll give you all a little Zen moment for a second here. Okay, enough of Zen. Um, um, we cannot change what we are not aware of, and once we are aware, we cannot help but change. And this is from Cheryl Sanders, the COO of Facebook. Um, so again, uh, it's important that um, um, that um, as allergists that we're um, trying to be cognizant of of uh, what patients' needs are um, from, from their histories, trying to figure out what we need to do and, and if we need to do testing and. Once we um, do the testing, can identify a problem, then we can address it. <clears throat> okay, so a little bit of historical um, uh, perspective. The first skin test was introduced by Blake, uh, Blackley in 1865, um, and this was a um, physician who um, was very inquisitive, and he basically took a lancet and abraded some skin. He took a piece of lint that he wet, and he put grass pollen on it, stuck it on someone's skin, put an occlusive dressing over it, and in a short period of time this person was itching and had this big um, reaction on their skin. Um, um, aha, this is the first skin test, or at least one of the first that we know of. Um, so um, the um, because you abrade the skin there's more risk of trauma and false positives. Um, and, um, and variable results, and so there were some refinements to this as time went on. Um, and in Manto in um, 1908 uh, proposed the first intracutaneous test, and then Lewis and Grant described the first prick test a number of years later. And for the most part, um, the testing um, procedure in itself hasn't changed much. The devices have changed and such, but the principles have been have been relatively the same. Um, and um, so we'll talk about this. So what's the mechanism of skin testing? Um, we're, what we're trying to do is, is detect the presence of allergen-specific Ig on, on um, mast cells. And so when we do skin testing um, and we're looking for reactions on skin testing, we're, we're assuming that the mast cells that are in the skin are similar to those in the, the eyes, the nose, the lungs, the GI tract, and that would have a similar response with, the, with um, allergen exposure. So an allergen is put in contact with the cutaneous uh, mast cells in the skin by doing the uh, prick skin testing. Um, you have binding of um, IgM mast cells, and then if you have an, enough um, of, um, mast cells, you can have cross-linking. Um, enough allergen present, you can have cross-linking, and this um, stimulates um, cell activation, which bibbity bobbity boo basically goes into having a wheel and flare. So you have you have the wheel, which is the um, which is the 
uh, swelling of the skin from a release of a variety of mediators. The one that we know most often is um, histamine, but there are a number of other mediators um, that are involved as well, like tryptase, chymase, um, and even prostaglandin T D2. But the, the wheel is your superficial um, edema. The flare is around that is the redness or the erythema from that. The other thing um, that people can have are late phase reactions, um, and this is something that um, periodically will come up, you'll have a patient in the clinic, you do a skin test on them, you don't find much, or you may find some things, and then, then um, the parents call you later that night or the next day and said, oh, he has a big reaction, you know, one of the spots, and, and it's painful and it's itchy, and, you know, what do we do about it? Is this some allergen that we missed and all this stuff? Well, this is a late reaction. I don't know. It's thought to be related to mast cells, but it's not related to clinical, um, to, um, uh, clinical um, scenarios or um, doesn't predict symptoms on exposure. Um, the, um, it's thought to be, in a, in a sense, like a, some form of like a delayed hypersensitivity, but, it's, um, but it can be anywhere from a couple to 24 hours after the fact. The interesting thing is more often, when I was doing some research on this, was more often they find it in sites where the skin test, the prick skin test was negative, that it occurs. Um, but um, I haven't heard much people um, ask me about this recently, but you know, usually like uh, once every year or so, there's you will get a note from a from a family or something that you're asking about that they had this reaction, didn't know what it was, and it was this important. To, we need to come back and have it looked at and all that stuff. Um, and for the most part, it's not thought to be important and not relate to to symptoms on exposure. So. Um, so if, again, it's um, just something you're aware of. So if someone calls you about this, then you know what you're, you're talking about. Okay, so what are the indications for skin testing? Um, well, we want to identify allergens, so environmental allergens, foods, drugs, stinging insect, and latex. Um, um, we use it to confirm sensitization to a particular allergen. So you're highly suspicious about something and you're using it to try to um, um, verify that. And also we use it to try to identify triggers that are related to allergic asthma, rhinitis, and conjunctivitis. So um, all stuff that we do. So um, this is a, a vital uh, part of what allergists do, and it's important that we know about it and how to do it correctly. Okay, there's also non-diagnostic um, purposes. Um, they do skin testing as part of standardization and we had a talk a few weeks ago about allergen um, standardization, and they talked about how they do that to standardize extracts. Um, we do uh, pharmacologic studies um, where skin testing is done. When I was a fellow, um, um, we used to do um, 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 skin testing um, to identify particular allergens. We'd have patients put on new drugs for asthma or for hay fever, um, and then um, as part of that process, after it's been on for a while, we would do skin testing again to see if that was altered by these products that they were put on sort of thing. Um, so um, there's things along those natures. Immunotherapy studies, again, um, people will do these things. And then epidemiologic studies. Um, um, so those are all important things to kind of think about. Um, the advantages of the skin test, um, the, um, um, the um, when we're talking about um, immediate skin tests as opposed to like patch testing, um, they're quick and simple to perform. You can do multiple allergens at a time. They're relatively inexpensive, um, highly sensitive, um, um, and um, you have results in 15, 20 minutes. Um, histamine peaks in eight minutes, so if you're doing controls on somebody and you want to know if they're reacting, you can actually go in, in eight minutes. It should peak in eight minutes. You don't have to wait 15, but for allergens, we wait 15 minutes. Um, and um, um, they, uh, for the most part, um, compare with um, 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 in vitro testing. The thing that's nice about this as opposed to in vitro testing is that you can get the results basically in 15 minutes as opposed to waiting a day or two or longer, depending if you have to send out to some reference lab. Um, and they've been shown to correlate with mucosal, nasal, and bronchial challenges. Um, so as I was saying before, um, we used to do um, skin testing for some of our research projects when I was a fellow. Um, we would find out someone's allergic to cat, dog, whatever. We'd try a new drug on them, asthma or allergy drug, and then we do 
then we do bronchial challenges with cat or ragweed or whatever to see the response. Um, so we were using the skin test to basically as a as kind of a surrogate to decide which would be best to do a, a bronchial challenge on. The other interesting thing is that, um, um, and I I didn't see it here when I was going through this, but I remember um, that. Um, some allergy testing, they used to use the eye, and they put pollen in the eye, and they use a, a, a filter paper, and they'd look at the reaction and look at the intensity of it, but they would put it in the conjunctiva, where you only could do one of those at a time. Um, but um, it seems kind of primitive now, but, but, it, but again, that correlated um, with clinical symptoms by doing um, these mucosal um, um, testing with, uh, with the conjunctiva. Um, so that was done years ago. Um, but again, there's correlation between um, mucosal nasal and bronchial challenges. So that's some important to know as you're doing stuff. Um, disadvantages of skin test, um, if they're performed improperly, you can get false negatives and false positives. Um, it's important, it's part of that, that the, your staff, um, whoever's doing skin testing, have competency and proficiency in doing those. Because again, that would um, increase the risk of false negatives and false positives. A positive skin test doesn't necessarily mean a patient is allergic or will have symptoms. It just indicates sensitization. Um, so to have a true allergy, as we talk about this in the clinic day after day after day, you have to have a history that correlates with exposure plus a positive test. Um, either one by itself doesn't indicate a true allergy. Um, um, they, other disadvantages is they can't be done if there's interfering drugs, and we'll talk about this in a little more detail later on, or if there's a significant skin disorder like severe eczema. Um, and um, false positives and false negatives can be problems because you false positives, you may overtreat someone, eliminate foods from a diet where they don't need to be eliminated, um, put them on unnecessary treatments for like immunotherapy or whatever. Um, and, if, and false negatives is that you have someone who is at risk for um, um, you know, having a severe reaction if you missed a food or you missed a, a stinging insect that's, um, that you didn't identify. So um, it's important that we do this right and we do it consistently. Um, so there's two types of immediate skin tests. There's the prick, puncture, epicutaneous, and then there's the interdermal. We're going to talk about both of these today. Um, so let's talk about safety first. Um, so a lot of the stuff we just do routinely in the clinic and it's, and it's become such a process um, and it's become second nature or habit that we don't think about the individual things that are necessary. But it's important every once in a while to, to step back and, and, and actually think what you're doing and to know that there is a process um, and to make these uh, um, skin testing safe. Skin testing is thought to be um, relatively safe, very for the most part, very safe if it's done properly, but there are some exceptions that make you more likely to have a reaction or have a higher risk of having a chance to reaction. And so um, I'm a big believer that everybody should always be prepared. Even if you're over-prepared, you're always prepared instead of being caught off guard. And so um, this is adapted from Middleton's, but it's a checklist that basically says, you know, never perform skin tests unless the physician is immediately available to treat systemic reactions because they can occur. Um, when I was a fellow, we used to do interdermal in addition to prick skin tests. In interdermal, you have a much higher risk of having anaphylaxis. Um, we were doing a, um, a, um, a study looking at potency of extracts um, for, um, um, to do, in a sense, sort of standardization sort of stuff with extracts when I first came here years ago. Um, we had uh, one of the residents was um, part, of, part of a study at the time. Um, and we were doing a series of interdermals on her to try to um, basically um, um, do standardization of this extract that was being worked on. Um, and um, she was highly allergic to the allergen that it was testing for, and um, she had a severe anaphylactic episode and ended up um, having to have multiple doses of epinephrine and had to spend the night in the ICU. Um, so I have great respect for um, for testing, and I have great respect for being prepared. Um, so interdermal is more likely. Um, you never do an interdermal if you have a significant positive prick skin test. You should always do a prick skin test first. If that's significantly positive, then there's no reason to do an interdermal. Um, um, so you should have emergency equipment, all your stuff readily available. Um, be careful with patients who have had a recent allergic re uh, reaction. Um, um, 
determine the potency and stability of the allergy extracts used, uh, be sure the concentrations are appropriate, because um, um, there's differences between like the interdermal and, um, and um, uh, concentrations and the ones used for um, prick skin testing. Um, and so you want to make sure you're using the correct one. Um, include a positive and negative control, perform um, tests on normal skin, check for dematographism, check for medications used and the timing before testing. And it's not a bad idea um, when you're working as a team in the clinic for, um, for if, a, you know, if the nurse or someone's asked about medications, that you also ask about medications. Because sometimes um, the family will forget about some medication they, with a medical um, tech who may be getting the intake um, or the nurse, um, they may not mention something, and so it's assumed they weren't on anything, um, or they don't have it on their list or something. They go, "Oh, by the way, yeah, um, you know, I bought some, I bought some um, cetirizine over the counter, uh, uh, and, sh and my child's taken it for the last two days or something." So it's always worthwhile when you go in the room just to verify, yes, you haven't been on any antihistamines or any other drugs that interfere with the testing. Um, and again, we talked about recording the skin test at, at the appropriate time. So you don't want to do it too early and you don't want to do it too late. Um, so let's talk about the uh, skin test first. Um, so you use it to detect an IgE reaction. Antigen is placed. Um, you have two ways of doing it. You can do with the um, devices, these plastic devices. And I'll show you a picture with a variety of different ones that are available. Um, when I trained, we used to uh, put drops of the extracts on the skin, and then we would take a lancet and we would basically prick the skin, poke it, so that basically you feel a little, um, a little um, pop in the skin as you lifted it up. So you go in about a 45 degree angle and you just grab a little bit of the skin, you just pop, and you feel that little pop when you did it, and um, usually had a good result. The um, um, the issue is when you do that, you have to have someone lie flat on their, on their stomach, have the drops, hopefully they don't run together when you put them, make sure they're uh, separated far enough. Um, and we used to do a lancet and clean it with alcohol, and then we used the same lancet. And then when uh, the HIV scare came in, then um, they said you couldn't do that. She so had to use a separate lancet for each one, and so some people got away from that. There's there's um, there's actually needles, these long needles that people use, and they're brown something needle. I forgot the name of it. I'll show you some of the devices. But there's a whole bunch of plastic devices. The plastic devices, however, have um, have little teeth on them. You can dip them in wells, and the allergen will get on the the device itself, and then you prick with that as opposed to putting them on the skin. Um, Okay, um, so your results in a wheel and a flare, like we talked about, they're more specific. Prick skin tests are more specific, um, and interdermal are more sensitive, and we'll talk about that. Um, and they correlate, prick skin tests correlate better with um, clinical allergy than um, interdermal skin testing, and they're um, safer. So this is, these are some of the devices. On the top, you see these one, these multi-test. Um, the multi-tests have improved. Um, when I was a fellow, they had a, a couple of these devices that um, the depth of the little spikes on the end uh, were, went so deep that you were actually doing almost interdermals. <laughs> and um, the other thing is that when you put these on, um, depending how you do it, do you push them on, do you rock them, and all these other things that people used to do, a lot of times there was no clear-cut instructions with some of these devices in the old days. Um, and so there was a fair amount of trauma that would occur with that, um, even though they were supposedly quicker because you could do, you know, these multi-tests with some of them had six or eight things, and you could just, you know, have like, um, you know, five little grids, and you just go bing, 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 you know, on the back or whatever, and wait. Um, but again, um, there was concerns, um, you know, about the amount of trauma and, and um, were they being more than just a prick skin test. The... Um, They've refined those devices. Um, I haven't used one in years. We used to do actually use those for um, uh, for antigen um, testing for um, um, patients with immune deficiency. Um, um, we test for for candida, trichophyton, and mumps, and uh, candida, and those sort of things. So, um, um, but on the bottom, you can see some of the the more common ones on the, the far right is a Dermapic, which we use in our clinic, but there's a whole variety of different um, devices out there, and there's probably more than what's in the picture here. Um, 
but the big thing is that whatever device you have, you need to know what the what the sensitivity of it is, and and also that you have proficiency doing it, and that you use the same device because these devices have, and I'll show you some slides here, but have different um, 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 risk of having a reaction to them uh, by just using the device by having a like a false positive, um, and so. Um, you have to know what your what your device that you're using, and it isn't like one day you use one device, the next day you use another device. You just need to be consistent with the device because they're not the same. Um, there have been a number of efforts to standardize skin testing, and for uh, fellows in the clinic, um, for those fellows out um, that are listening to this that are starting their training, um, it is not uncommon um, to um, especially with people being more mobile nowadays, that um, um, you'll see patients who have moved around and they've seen an allergist in another part of the country and they come to you and they want you to continue allergy um, um, uh, immunotherapy for them or have skin tests that, even if they're not in immunotherapy, but have been, have been told they're allergic to X, Y, and Z and they want you to take over their care and you're looking at the, um, some records you get from their former doctor um, and um, uh, um, a lot of these records, uh, unfortunately, this got better. But in the past, a lot of these records were uh, very minimal, and there'd be like it'd be like one plus, two plus, three plus. You don't know what that meant. It had no. It, there was no um, grading system that told you what that meant. Um, you didn't know what extracts they were using because there's different extract companies. Some of our extracts are standardized. A number of them aren't. Um, so it's it's the um, the reaction to um, to a particular tree at, for a, a product that's from ALK or Greer may be different um, because there's different sta they're not standardized um, and um, um, and um, some of them you would even see um, listings for positive and negative controls you didn't even know if they did controls. Um, and so there was a lot of variability and in an effort to try to make it simpler, because what would happen is if uh, uh, Mary here was, um, was an allergist in Plains, Georgia, where Jimmy Carter is, um, <laughs> she's down there in peanut country, and she's doing skin testing, and then her patient moves to Kansas because the family's at Fort Leavenworth or something, and they come to see us, and they have this, this um, uh, skin test results. Um, again, if, if there's not much information there, it's hard for us to know what that means and how significant those are. If you don't even have positive negative controls. Um, and the other thing, especially in those patients that are on immunotherapy and you're looking at, at skin test results because you're trying to decide what you're going to put a, the amount of immunotherapy here for. And in the past, what would happen is that we'd get these results. You couldn't really interpret very much. So you go, well, um, we're just going to have to start all over. We're going to have to retest you and, you know, whatever. Um, there's been a big push over the last 10 to 15 years, um, led initially by the college, but the academy is involved as well in the practice parameter group, to basically to have some standardized um, skin testing forms. And the college on their website has um, examples of skin test forms that are available that you can actually download from the, from the website if you want to use theirs. But basically, um, and I'll show you a slide here in a minute, but it, and we have ours has been adapted um, to try to have some more standards, but basically the skin test should have like the allergens used, the manufacturer, the controls, the criteria for a positive reaction, the grading systems, and all this stuff should be there. Okay, so this is a, um, as you can't see it very well, but on the bottom of ours, um, we have here that the uh, prick skin tests were applied to the back using the Dermapic system. Um, uh, they're read at 15 to 20 minutes um, after application. Um, um, interdermals are applied um, to the arm using a TB syringe. And up here it tells the allergen extracts that we use from, in this case, it says Greer. It tells the histamine, what our concentration of histamine is. tells you what our allergens are. Um, and the other thing is, and down here at the bottom, it says a positive is at least um, tested as 3 millimeters wheel or 5 millimeters of erythema um, um, greater than your negative control. So. Um, um, again, um, uh, um, there's been a big effort so that people put this so that if you, if we did skin testing here and then this patient goes to see Mary in Plains, Georgia, that she has a better idea of what those mean, okay? 
So it's a little easier to decide, well, do I need to re-skin test this person, or is this similar to what I'm doing? Um, and maybe I can, um, you know, do a similar extract and do some skin testing or do brush immunotherapy or something if I'm going to put someone back on allergy shots, but you have some other options instead of starting from square one all over again. Okay, so this is an example of someone who's reacted quite a bit. You can see the skin tests are placed. You see all these wheels and flares there. Um, which are positive reaction you can see at the at the the very back uh, the very bottom of the um, the um, um, the back where you have the the controls. Um, so the technique um, basically again this is something that we that we do routinely we don't think about what we're doing um, but um, and this is why it's important when fellows uh, first start their training that if they have any downtime that they spend as much time as they can to um, um, in the clinic if they have some downtime to go along with the nurses, um, try to do some skin testing with some of the nurses after observing for a while just to get the ex experience and just the whole technique of what you're doing. So you want to clean the back with 70% alcohol and you put a drop of allergen if you're um, in most of these are 1 to 10 or 1 to 20 weight per volume. Um, we'll talk about um, it, we usually use the um, the back or the volar surface of the forearm, depending on the age and what we're, excuse me what we're testing for. Um, again, if the device has um, 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 the, is the device you dip in the well, then the allergen will be on the device itself. Um, and um, usually, it's thought that you should go in at about a 45 degree angle to to get the right angle to do that prick or pop sort of thing. Um, the test should be at least two centimeters apart to avoid overlap so you're not having these big flares that go in the next one. You're not sure which is which. Um, oh, goodness. Um, the, uh, the positive, we use um, histamine, and our negative is um, 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 glycerin saline or some sort of saline. It, um, it's often recommended that you have this glycerinated saline if your extracts are glycerinated. So it's the same thing that they use with diluent in the... Um, um, in the um, um, extract bottles, um, check drugs that were taken and when, and check for dermatographism prior to testing. Um, um, you know, um, my experience of if if someone has um, very fair skin, they're more likely to be dermatographic, at least in a, kind of a gestalt for me. Um, if um, I usually um, ask parents if their skin's real sensitive, if they is, then I just um, um, take a the end of a blunt end of a, a Q-tip and just just uh, stroke the skin and wait a few minutes to see if they're dermatographic um, because you can if someone's dermatographic you can put all these skin tests on and at the end everything lights up and you can't really make much from it and you've kind of wasted a lot of time energy and, and resources and so um, really uh, you should be think you should be thinking about testing for dermatographics for fellows. They should think about doing that probably every time they do a skin test, just to just so they get that experience and, and get a feel for how often that occurs, what type of patients. Okay, so common errors in skin testing, um, they're placed to close okay. to the overlap mm -hmm. reactions. Hello? Oh, it's Linda. Um, I know in my practice, I sort of gave the nurses permission to stop testing if the patient starts lighting up or if the history is such that I know they're going to have huge reactions to grass and trees, I'll tell them just uh, do them first and then take a look. But rarely I've had people have systemic reactions from PRIP. Can you comment on that? Or, or if I know it's going to be really hot, I'll do that afterwards on their own or something. Yeah. I. I, I if I'm really suspicious of someone having, you know, like big reactions to ragweed or to to um, some of the individual trees or whatever, um, I usually let the nurses know that and make sure that they've they they're spacing the skin test appropriately. Um, and um, um, but again, if I um, if I see someone who has very fair skin, um, I'm more likely or um, um, to check, just do a quick check for dermatographism before I put the skin test on. Um, um, but if you if you put the the skin test on, you're putting on your controls, and you see that the 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 sal the saline is already lit up and has a wheel and a flare, then I think it tells you that 
um, you don't have to do the other ones, I guess. So it may be a, a, mess, uh, may be a way of just doing your controls first as you're putting on skin tests and just seeing what those, what those do before you put the rest of them on. I know sometimes with those patients, we were able to get valid results when we did the prick up method versus just pressure down. Um, yeah, the the I mean you can you can also look at you know if it's three millimeters greater than your negative control. So if your saline is three by five or something, you can look at that. It just makes it a little more difficult when you're trying to interpret it sometimes, but okay. it's possible. Things you have to worry about besides the overlapping reactions, you can have bleeding that can lead to false positive. So if someone does this and is too traumatic, um, you can you can have um, reactions as well just from the trauma. So it looks like it's a positive when it really isn't. Poor technique of not, suffi not sufficiently pricking the skin. You're just kind of scratching the skin a little bit, and it does. And you can have false negatives. Um, and then, as I said before, when you put drops on, and then you prick through the drops. Um, they can run together, sort of thing. So even when we do the the um, uh, here, we use the Dermapic. When we use that, um, the nurses you'll see them. They'll have the kids lie on their back. They do the 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 pricks. They will put paper towels and they'll just put them on the back to blot. Just push them down and then lift them up um, to try to get any excess allergen off the skin, so they're not going to run and, and cause confusion. Um, what I was talking about before about the different devices. Um, this is a, a study um, um, that was from uh, Hale Nelson and um, John Oppenheimer, where they looked at the different devices um, and they looked at the size of the wheels that are are larger than 99% of the wheels with saline using the same device on the patient's back performed by the operator. And so it shows you devices in which um, three millimeters of wheel would be sufficient or significant to distinguish between a positive and negative and ones where you need more. And again, so it's the, it tells you, um, you know, what the devices would be. So like the duo tip would be 3.5 greater than your negative control sort of thing. So um, again, there's differences in devices. You need to be aware of that. Okay, and again, um, so if you were practicing here and then you went to some other practice when you graduated and they're using a different device, don't just assume it's the same thing, okay? Um, this is interdermal skin testing, putting the bleb, and basically um, you, you um, um, take a small volume, um, 0 0.2 to um, 0 0.05 is injected intracutaneously, use a superficial bleb. Um, you only need as much, you only have to inject as much to get a bleb. Once you have a bleb, you're done. You don't have to try to get all the rest of it in there. Um, the interdermal skin testing is far more sensitive than prick and puncture testing, um, but usually not, not of a much significant benefit, additional benefit. Um, requires about a thousandfold less concentration, uh, concentrated extracts than those used in prick and puncture testing to achieve a similar result. Um, you can't use glycerinated extracts for interdermals. Uh, or glycinated controls for interdermals because it can be irritating in itself. Um, um, and um, so you use a, a, a weaker concentration of histamine um, when you're doing that. So if you're doing interdermals, you have to do interdermal controls with histamine as well, not just the, that's not rely on the prick ones. Um, um, and again, always, if you're doing uh, pricks and in interdermals, where I trained, we did prick skin testing. If the prick skin tests were negative or barely positive, then the patient would get interdermals to the rest of that. Um, um, there's not a lot of evidence that having a um, negative prick and only a positive interdermal is, is, is clinically significant um, um, or that would benefit from immunotherapy to that substance. And Hale Nelson has done some of those studies in the past. Um, but again, if, you, if you're doing prick and it's all by interdermals, if you have a significant positive on the prick, don't do an interdermal. You're increasing the risk of having anaphylaxis. Um, okay. Common errors in interdermal testing, sites too close together can cause um, false positives. Too much volume injection, um, um, only need enough for a bleb. High concentrations of allergen can lead to false positives. Um, sometimes people will try to put it in the to do the interdermal, and they don't really get in. It splashes all over the skin, and that's um, you can have that. Um, you can get if you go too deep, you can you can get um, a trauma, and you get a false um, you can get a false negative. And um, too many um, tests performed at the same time can induce a systemic reaction. Like I was talking about that research patient that we did um, 
where we knew this person was going to um, re um, react to um, to this allergen, and we were doing cereal with interdermals with that allergen sort of thing. <coughs> um, contraindications to skin testing. Um, um, someone who's had a recent um, anaphylactic event, you may uh, pause to think about um, doing testing. Taking medicines that interfere with treatment of, anaf um, of anaphylaxis, like beta blockers. Um, someone with significant atopic dermatitis, someone with dermatographism, chronic urticaria, mastocytosis, and patients who are at high risk for anaphylaxis, like poorly controlled asthma, reduced lung function, and those that have um, history of severe reactions with minimal amount of allergen exposure. Um, relative contraindications, so someone with significant cardiovascular disease, you just have to be careful about. Um, frail health in the elderly and pregnancy, um, because of the risk that if you have the anaphylaxis to the patient or to the fetus in the case of someone who's pregnant, um, the, um, 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 again, there may be some situations in those patients where the, um, the benefit outweighs, outweighs the risk. Um, so if you had, we've had scenarios where there's a mother who's pregnant who um, they want to treat for syphilis and the patient supposedly, the mother supposedly, has a history of allergen penicillin, so you really have to do skin testing to penicillin and find out. Um, um, someone with recent anaphylaxis, um, um, the, uh, um, this is s historically, um, this is something we always talked about, patients who had been um, stung um, with a stinging insect, um, that we wait um, a month or so afterwards because of, of uh, um, the thought that they may not have recovered enough from their from releasing all their mediators, and you may not you may have a false um, negative result. Um, I haven't um, particularly done this with with um, like foods or environmental allergens. Um, however, it's rare it's rare that I have someone who had an anaphylaxis that comes in like the next day or the next week that's going to be tested for that. Uh, the other thing to realize is that in vitro testing usually isn't affected as much by that. So you can always do a blood test if there are allergens available. Um, um, and again, if you if you feel uh, obligated to do it, you can do it. If it's positive, great. That means it's positive. Um, so, um, uh, but if it's negative, you may um, have um, uh, reason to consider doing it again or later on. Um, and again, allergen-specific IG is less affected by um, anaphylaxis. This is just a chart of showing you um, the um, See my my uh, columns got kind of moved around when I adjusted the the page. I'm sorry about that. But basically, um, um, antihistamines are the ones that have the most effect on skin testing. Um, the um, and also amipramines. Um, so tricyclic antidepressants will have an effect. Um, there are a variety of drugs, and these are some that are listed. Um, even uh, which I didn't realize, but um, Puva. Um, can actually have an effect up to four weeks um, for someone who's getting that for skin testing. Um, things like Montelukast don't really have any effect on skin testing. So those are all things you should be aware of. What are the most common drugs that affect um, skin testing? Um, other factors that affect are the area of the body. It's thought that the middle and the upper back are, are more sensitive than the lower back, um, that the um, that back is, is more sensitive than the forearm. The, the forearm near the, near the antecubital is more sensitive than near the wrist, um, and there's all these things like that. Um, um, age, usually beyond three months, um, patients will, um, will respond to um, uh, prick skin testing. Um, they may have smaller responses at a young age than uh, smaller wheels and flares, um, but they can respond. And it's historically thought that after age 50, your reactivity um, starts um, getting less and less. Um, but as Dr. Marshall talked about um, about a month ago when he was talking about um, asthma and allergies in the elderly, those patients um, still can be um, tested, and there's some patients that, if, uh, as they get older, still can benefit from immunotherapy. Um, there's really no clear-cut difference in gender, race, um, in healthy non-atopic blacks will have a, have a bigger response than, than other races. Um, the thing that you also have to do with darker pigmented skin, it's harder to, to, to identify the, the flare, um, so that's always a challenge. Um, pathologic conditions like severe eczema um, that can diminish the response to histamine, 
Um, you may also have problems in patients with chronic renal failure and some cancer patients, and also avoid any skin lesions that you have on the skin uh, themselves. Um, again, we talked about the drugs that are more likely to, um, to interfere with skin testing already. Um, grading of the skin test, um, um, again, histamine peaks at eight minutes, um, 15 minutes for allergen. The prick should be at least three millimeters um, greater than your saline control, uh, which is your negative control, and flare at least five millimeters greater than that. Um, historically, a lot of people um, uh, put things as one plus, two plus, three plus, except uh, Mary's one plus, two plus, three plus, four plus may be different than Jordan's and different than mine. Um, and when I trained, um, um, one of my attendings, um, you know, would just go in the room and just go tell the nurse, oh, this is one plus, this is two plus, three plus, whatever sort of thing. And and there are people that, you know, are pretty adept at doing that. However, they, um, Dr. McCann and OMB um, a number of years ago did a study where they took pictures of skin tests um, and had a number of allergists say, okay, do you think this is one plus, two plus, three plus? And there was a lot of variation there. Um, and so actually it's been suggested the best way to do is to measure the the longest diameter um, of the, the wheel um, and the longest of the flare. To be even a little more specific, people will do the longest diameter of the wheel and then a perpendicular to that, measure that, and then do a, a, mean, di a mean diameter from that. Um, um, I think the studies have shown there's not that much difference between just doing the largest diameter and doing the mean. And so for simplicity's sake and ease of doing it in the clinic, um, and for the time's sake, uh, most people would just do the, the, the widest diameter. Uh, when I was a fellow, we did the, the uh, we did two measurements for the wheel and for the flare. So it was like the wheel, so we did both measurements. So we had on our skin test, so we, like the, the wheel was five by seven and the, the, the flare was, you know, 10 by 15 or whatever sort of thing. Um, so um, anyways, um, the, when they were doing, when they were calculating this before, they, traditionally it's thought that the, that the wheel was the three plus, I mean, the, the histamine control was a three plus. Um, so anything that's sub substantially bigger than that, or um, some people would say double that would be a four plus. Um, it used to be that if you had a pseudopod or, um, or satellite lesions off the skin test where these little spots off the um, reactions off to the side of that, that would automatically make it a four plus. If it was, um, if it was half the size of the of the three plus that was considered a two plus and so on and so on and so on. Um, so, but again, you can see where there'd be a lot of variation. So someone just sends you someone who has been skin tested and said they had a one plus, two plus, three plus to these allergens and you go, what does that mean? <laughs> um, so anyways, um, this is, the, um, I cut this out of one of the, uh, one of the textbooks. But this was a, a chart of kind of like um, talking about one plus, two plus, three plus in different ways that people had done them in the past. Um, and there's still a lot of um, allergists out there that have their own variation of this that they use. And it's further, for, they know what, they, you know, have their gestalt of what it is and how important it is and, and how they treat their patients. But again, if you're with people moving from, from doctor to doctor, it's, it's not very helpful if I don't know what, Jordan system or Mary system is, or how to quantitate that. Um, um, positive reactions without clinical history is sensitization versus true allergy. So you have to have that history. Um, you have to also be able to, to um, realize you're going to have false positive, false negatives, um, and there's to be and there's correlation with in vitro, in vitro testing, which we'll save for another lecture. Um, <laughs> methods of verifying proficiency. Um, um, just like with all laboratory procedures that people do, um, like in our labs, they have they have all these quality measures to make sure that these tests are done um, the same way and that they're all, um, you know, that doesn't matter if you had the test done on Monday or two weeks from Tuesday, that, you know, the test will be done the same way and it's just as accurate. Um, so with these devices that we use, a lot of um, um, interoperative um, operator differences, um, even in the same person, depending on their level of experience. Um, and so it's, it's important to know the device you're using, feel comfortable with it, and also that you stay with the same device um, so that you don't move around from different devices sort of things because um, they're not all the same. And um, to ensure consistency, it's important that anybody doing skin tests undergo evaluation of their technique to make sure they're doing it well. 
Um, um, there's been a number of standards that have suggested the most lenient standard was put out has been um, that the coefficient of variation be less than 30 percent when you do when you do um, uh, repeated skin testing. Um, and um, watching someone do skin testing and then doing a few skin tests yourself isn't sufficient to to um, prove competency or proficiency. Um, so we do we do a competency skin test with our fellows, and then historically we've done it with the nurses here, um, and this is based on some um, some data that was put together by Dr. Oppenheimer and Dr. Nelson, um, and we use the coefficient of variation of less than 30 percent as being proficient, um, and so we offer hands-on experience to our nurses and our fellows, um, and this is one of the competencies as far as skin testing. Um, that our fellows do besides the competency checklist. We have the fellows um, do skin testing on each other after they've had enough experience to feel comfortable um, doing the skin testing. Um, and for the most part, the, what's surprising is our fellows, um, I guess, uh, do, such, uh, do a good job. I can only think of one fellow um, probably in the last 10 years that hasn't passed the proficiency on the first try because they, I think they, they um, make an effort to try to um, do some of this on their own and then um, basically um, try to follow the, way, the right way of doing it, and um, uh, we've been pretty lucky. Um, um, the, there's also controversy about how often you need to do this um, and to, to show that you're maintaining proficiency. In the old days, we tried to do it with the nurses every um, one to two years, and that's become increasingly difficult as, as we've got more nursing staff and um, more clinics. Um, this is... Um, um, an example of what we use, um, and basically um, we use a series of uh, prick um, skin tests with saline interdermal. They're alternated, um, and so I'll show you pictures here in a minute. Um, and we put them on the patient's back. You record histamine uh, results at eight minutes. Um, and what you do is you outline the, the um, flares for each of the reactions with a with an indelible marker, a magic marker, and then um, with a fine tip marker, um, and then you uh, place strips of tape over that and um, peel it off the back and then put it on a piece of, um, of white paper, uh, and then you can use that to measure the different reactions. Um, and um, um, so you do the, you measure the, 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 the wheels and the flares, um, and um, then you calculate from your, from the tape that you transferred to the paper, you calculate the mean diameter, so you do, as we talked about, the, the largest across the 90 degrees to that, and you add this up, and there's a whole um, um, calculation that's there that talks about how you add them all up and do the mean, um, and you figure out the, the coefficient of variation, um, and if you're under 30 percent, um, um, you're considered proficient in doing that. And so um, um, we... Um, this is what we do here, and we do it with the fellows. Um, we do this um, once a year with the fellows, um, where they do the, the competency for the skin testing. And again, we in the past used to do it more frequently with the nurses, but haven't done it in a couple of years with the nurses just because of um, nursing issues. Um, but it's something we've been talking about um, doing, and it's important. And Dr. Nelson and uh, Dr. Oppenheimer, when they've talked, they also say that you know this is something that every office should be doing. All the staff should be doing, not only just the, the nurses or the techs, but the physicians as well should be for, proficient in this. And there's times when you're going to the hospital to do a consult and you're doing the skin test. It's not, you know, um, so you need to be proficient in this stuff. We had, we've had fellows in the past who started their own practice. They had, to, they had to go there and teach people how to do skin tests. So they had to know how to do it themselves. So um, it's, a, it's something we should do. So this is, um, we do this procedural competency workshop. Um, and um, um, I think it's important. Um, this is an example where you can see the histamine and salines alternated on the back. Um, and um, um, last last year we did this at Christmas time, and so we see the histamine and then the circle where the, the wheel was, and so it says, ho, 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 it should go down the back. <laughs> so um, a little levity. Um, okay, this is our competency uh, skin test um, checklist that we do with the fellows as part of the procedural competencies. All the fellows uh, have seven procedures to graduate that they have to be competent in. And when they've, um, when they've done enough skin testing um, and they have enough experience, then we, besides doing the, the procedural competency with actually hands-on skin testing, we have them do a, um, a checklist that we go over um, and ask them questions on. Um, 
The importance, again, is for the proficiency verification is decreased risk of false positive, negative results, better diagnostic accuracy, avoidance of unnecessary therap therapies, decreased risk of failure to, to, um, to properly treat someone so someone really has a food allergy, drug allergy, needs emergency medications, they have it, decrease the cost of unnecessary testing and therapies, and overall better and safer care and more effective care for our patients. Um, um, in the last couple of minutes, I'm going to talk about um, uh, skin test proficiency. Um, Dr. Betty Liu, who is from Tennessee, um, wrote a recent um, article in Annals where they did a quality improvement project in their own um, office, and they also thought it was important um, to do competency um, or proficiency and competency skin testing for the staff. Um, and um, they were curious to know how well the staff did and, had it, and if it had anything to do with the, how long they'd been there and been working. Um, so um, what they did is they got all the staff, the physicians, nurse practitioners, the nurses, um, all did skin testing on each other. They used the, instead of the back, they compromised and used the forearms to do the skin testing, but basically the same technique that we described with the alternating histamines and salines um, and of the, um, all the staff um, tested, only seven of 20 met the criteria on, the, on their first attempt. Um, um, the patients, uh, or the, the, the staff that had more than four years of experience um, working there um, were the ones that had more consistency in their values and were more likely to pass. Um, they concluded there was an inverse relationship of experience and coefficient of variation, regardless of the operator, it didn't matter if it was a nurse or a physician. Um, and um, they um, 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 talked about having um, the importance of dedicating sufficient time to guarantee re reproducibility <laughs> is important. Um, we're using these tests to, to treat our patients, and a lot of what we do is based on the testing we do. If our testing isn't done correctly, then what are we doing, mm -hmm. you know? So it's, it comes down to the bottom line. So they recommended doing a larger uh, multi-site multi uh, trial. Um, to try to get more information on this, and um, they recommended, especially in people that were in, um, that had been working in the office for less than four years, um, that they have more frequent um, um, testing of their proficiency, and that may be quarterly, twice a year, yearly, or whatever. But that that um, that it be done more frequently to basically to just verify that they're proficient and um, uh, and that their technique is consistent. Um, and I heartily agree with that. Um, in summary, um, immediate skin tests confirm sensitization to an allergen. Um, immediate skin tests are simple, safe, reproducible, and sensitive. Interpretation of testing and identify a true allergy relies on your history. Proper um, um, help in providing better diagnostic testing, safer care, and appropriate care for our patients. And the value of skin tests relies on proper technique and person doing the testing, maintaining proficiency. Um, so these are some of my references, um, and this is um, my peace and tranquility in the fall. That's all. I'm um, um, looking out for my homestead, um, or my soon-to-be homestead in Utah, looking over uh, Park City. Um, you can see some snow in the mountains already. Um, I'm going there this weekend to check on the build. <laughs> um, and so um, thank you for your interest. Um, if anybody has any questions, I will try to answer. Them.